Do you realize that just three weeks ago today we finished up the Feast of Tabernacles or God's Fall Holy Days for 2020? It seems like it's been three months, looking back for myself. But we just finished three, ones, three weeks ago today where we once again were reminded of that unbelievable plan that God has in mind for all mankind. And I know where we were at the feast this year, we heard messages that reminded us as first fruits that we have been handpicked by our Creator to be a part of His work now. And the messages we heard really talked about that and kind of reminded us we, we got work to do, right? We have to get, you know, get moving. We understand that when God's kingdom is, is established on earth that we will join a kingdom of priests and will inherit everlasting life. And what an incredible opportunity that is that you and I have been given. It's really more, though, than an opportunity, isn't it? <clears throat> it's more than an opportunity. See, it's a promise. God has called us. He's called you and I. He's given us the tools that we need to overcome Satan and this world. And he expects, not hopes, or crosses his fingers and hopes the best for us. No, he expects us, every one of us, to be there. And at this point, the only reason that we might not be there is if we do something to lose that most precious future that has been promised, by the, promised for the faithful of God. Yet with all the chaos, if you will, with all the anger, the lying, the lack of morality, the violence. I could go on and on. It's so easy, brethren, for you and I to get off track. And even if we are able to at times filter out what's going on in the world that is wrong, at times just our, our simple schedule, or I shouldn't say our simple, our hectic schedule, can also quickly get us off track. And this is something that's been on my mind quite a bit lately, as at times I found myself, as I read the news or I watch, watch TV, I find myself at times having a lot more frustration and anger than I ever should. To say what we're going through in 2020 is, is terrible, and every day has been life-changing in, in a lot of ways would be really an understatement. But to try to sort out what we're being told by our elected officials and, or the agencies that we deal with or the media, to try to sort out what is truth and what is not can be exhausting and maddening. If I told you that you were lied to every day, you wouldn't be surprised. In my work, in my town, even in God's church, there, there's turmoil over things sometimes as simple as wearing a mask. I have a good friend who's... He hates the masks as much as I do. But he tells me he's not going to follow the order in his state because it goes against God's law. I simply can't see that. I hate wearing a mask myself, but out of my respect for fellow man, um, and because we are to be law-abiding citizens, as long as it is not contrary to God's law, I will wear my mask. But brethren, there's so many areas in my life, and probably yours too, where I need to make sure that I'm steadfast in my beliefs and to be a doer, not just a hearer. You see, I need to tune out all the distractions and focus on my calling in a very single-minded way. Brenda and I listened to a sermon last night, <clears throat> a very good sermon, and he asked a couple questions. One of them was, and it really struck me, he said, do you see your calling with clarity? Do you see your calling with clarity? Is it clear in your mind? He also asked a little later, he said, do you see the need for God's kingdom to come soon? And I'd ask for you to keep those questions in mind as we kind of go through this sermon. You see, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know when we look around and see all of the horrendous things going on in our world. But turn over to Micah, if you will, just to set the stage a bit. Micah 7 has a, there's a set of scriptures here, and I want to go through this and just see 
If this doesn't sound a little familiar to what we're seeing today. <clears throat> Book of Micah, chapter 7. I want to read verses 2 to 7 as I continue to set the stage for the sermon. Micah 7, starting in verse 2, it says, The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. Verse 3, that they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe. And the great man utters his evil desire. Sound familiar? It says, so they scheme together. The best of them, it says, is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. Verse 5. Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of more mouth from her who lies in your bosom. For son dishonors father. Daughter rises up against her mother. Daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his old household. Verse 7. Therefore I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. And my God will hear me. Brethren, does that sound at all familiar to the world that we live in? Can you clearly see, that's easy for me to say, can you clearly see the need, the desperate need for Christ's return? Along with that, and something that I want us each to internalize, can you clearly see the imperative need for you and I to once and for all get absolutely focused on getting our own lives in order? And I want you to please let that question sink in. I'll ask it again. Can you see the imperative need right now for you and I to once and for all get absolutely focused on getting our lives in order? A natural follow-up question, I guess, for would be, if not now, when? What are we waiting for? How long will we put God off? Brethren, how long will we continue to keep one foot in the world and refuse to take our calling seriously? And I'm not telling you anything. You know this. Please understand, this is a life or death situation. And I ask myself at times, what could I possibly be waiting for? This afternoon, I want to spend the sermon time talking about a subject that, if succumbed to, will most definitely put the incredible future that God has promised each of us in jeopardy. The title of my sermon and the question I want us to discuss today is simply this, are you single-minded? Are you single-minded? And we could put it this way, are you finally ready, with absolute certainty, to be single-minded and take your precious calling truly serious. Brethren, it's time for us to take the gloves off and fight with all of our might so that we will inherit eternal life. Turn over to chapter to James, if you will. We're going to see that the Apostle James talked about this very subject. And he specifically talks about it, and we've, we, I've used this in a message before, the whole concept of being double-minded. But because the concept is, is so important, I, and, and something I think that we all can struggle with at times, I want to revisit that just a bit today. We're going to discuss the meaning of double-mindedness and the consequences then for us if we, if we become this way. In James, in the book of James, we'll see the Apostle Paul use the term double-mindedness twice. And let's start in James 1, um, verse 1. It says, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, 
and it will be given him. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let's look at the other place that he mentions it, James 4, just a couple pages back. James 4, verses 7 through 10. James 4, verses, starting in verse 7. It says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. And verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brethren, being double-minded is a very real problem, and it can be very damaging to Christians, whether we like it or not. You and I are very susceptible to it. You see, being double-minded is, is, again, a very real problem that can manifest itself in, er in very many areas of our lives, and we're going to talk about a few today. But first, let's talk about just about what this term means. The Greek word translated double-minded is number uh, 1374. It's called dispucho, dipsuchos, from D-I-S, dis meaning twice, and P-S-U-C-H-E meaning mind. And as we saw James use it here, he used it to describe someone who is who's divided in their interest or their loyalties. Someone who, who is wavering or uncertain. Someone who is half-hearted. And as we look at James further today, we're going to see double-mindedness as a theme throughout the entire letter that he wrote. To set the stage a little further, though, I want to point out that even godly men from our Bible lapsed at times into double-mindedness. Do you remember the story of John who baptized Christ? You remember when... He saw this. He saw the Holy Spirit descend upon Christ, as it talks about, in quote, in bodily form like a dove. He saw that with his own eyes. Okay? And he heard a voice from heaven say this, You are my beloved Son, and you I, in you I am well pleased. He saw it. He heard that voice. But do you remember the story later? When he was in prison... After landing in prison, John sent men to Christ. This is in Luke 7. You can look it up later. Asking him, are you the coming one or do we look for another? This is what he said even after what he saw with his own eyes. What he heard with his own ears. Brethren, we, we know, we can see here, John the Baptist was human, and we as humans can begin to doubt sometimes, or maybe I use a word, we, we can begin to drift, if you will. You know, maybe there's those times when God seems not to answer our prayers. Maybe we drift. But even though John's words reflected doubt, Christ, you remember, described him as greater than any prophet born before him. I find that very encouraging. You know, even after what he said and after his doubt, I find that encouraging. And we need to remember that as we humbly seek God's way in all matters, that he promises to remember us according to our faith, just as he remembered John the Baptist. Brethren, becoming double-minded in any way is, is something that I specifically want to guard against in my life. And I ask you as we go through this message to, to look at yourself, okay? Look at yourself and decide if you could ever succumb to this way of thinking. And I also ask as we go through this message that you ask yourself repeatedly, are you taking your calling seriously? Maybe I should phrase it this way. To be clear, ask yourself if God thinks you're taking your calling seriously. 
With that said, then let's start considering just some of the ways where we absolutely must be single-minded in regards to our calling. The first is back in James 1, if you want to turn there. James 1, we're going to look at verses 5 and 8, 5 through 8. And this first area is going to discuss how we pray. How we pray. James 1, verses 5 through 8. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Sorry, for, yeah, uh, it's like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Can you picture this metaphor in verse 6? My study Bible put it this way. It says, he who doubts is like a wave rising one moment and falling the next. One minute he believes, the next he does not. It goes on to say, one time he says yes to God's will, and the next time no. Never truly making up his mind which way he believes. He staggers, helpless in prayer, like a drunken man. So again, we can see James describing here someone who is, who is dubious or, or uncertain. And we, looking on here, he describes the, this person who is indecisive in prayer as a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. See, brethren, it's so easy for us as we pray for certain things to, to reason away why something doesn't apply to us and, you know, and blindly make our own rules. Have you ever found that? Found yourself doing that to justify our actions? I have in the past to say things like, well, <laughs> you know, that's just who I am. God understands me. To say, if you've been through what I have in my life, you'd understand does that sound familiar? The bigger question that I'd honestly ask myself and ask you, self, do you think either one of those ways of thinking fly with God? Do you see anywhere in your Bible, in, the, in the, you know, all the commandments and the instructions were given, that there's any disclaimers? You look and, oh, here's an asterisk by this one. You go down and say, aha, that one doesn't apply to me. Brethren, that's, if you look around, that's how Satan has the world thinking. Right? Well, that doesn't apply to me. I can do what I want. Brethren, at times, he can have us thinking that way, too. You see, doubt, wishy-washiness, asking for things that are against God's will in our prayers to God, short circuits our relationship with him. Maybe before we ask God for anything, we should ask ourselves questions that bear directly on our prayers. Things like, is what I'm asking according to his will? Hold your place, look at, back to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 1 John 5, verse 14. And tell, this tells us why this question is what I'm asking according to God's will. It tells us why this is important. It says in verse 14, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So when we consider prayer, a first question we should ask potentially is, is what I'm asking according to God's will? A second question we might ask is, are my attitude and life in tune with the will of God? What do I mean by that? Well, what do we focus on daily? Are we caught up in the cares of this world and the troubles of this world? Are we focusing on all the injustices? And that, there's a lot of them. 
terrible, terrible things going on in this world. Terrible things. Are we focusing on the injustices and the politics and the untruths to the point that we're losing a focus to our relationship with God and his people? That we're taking our eyes off the prize just for a bit? See, it can so easily happen. And again, I find myself at times so frustrated that I forget to remember that God is in charge of everything. He will put the people that he wants in office when he wants. And it's hard to watch our country go through some of these things. But don't we know that has to happen? Every one of us here wants Christ to return. And we know it has to happen, but it's hard to watch. And we need to remember, God will put in office who he wants, and he will do it to see his plan through. And I have my opinions. But you know what? My opinions really do not matter. Do we understand that? See, we all have our opinions on a lot of these things, but do we truly understand the only opinion that matters is God's. Not my opinion, nor yours. See, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not telling us anything that we don't know. It's, we know in our minds all of these things have to be so, and they must come to pass before Christ will return. And if we had just that discussion, every single one of us would say, hasten the day. Turn back a couple pages, if you will, to 1 John 3, verse 22. John here stresses the importance of obedience. Start in verse 18. Yeah, let's start in verse 18. He says, My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Verse 20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Verse 23 and this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. We believe that, every single one of us. Here's a scary thought for me, and I've used this before too. I don't believe that the Bible is complete yet. Right? I think there's still chapters to be written. We have chapters written on Matthew and John and Ruth. Could there be a chapter written about you? At this point, I don't want to see what's in there. If I look back at my life so far, I'd be very embarrassed. What's the third question, brethren, that we can ask ourselves? How about this? Is, are my motives for this prayer God-centered or self-centered? You can write down James 4, verse 3. He says this. He tells us to be careful what we pray for. James 4, verse 3, he says, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So those are just three questions that we could ask. But of those three, if we could answer yes to the first two, okay, if we could answer yes to the question, is what I'm asking according to God's will? And if we can answer yes, are my attitudes and life in tune with God? If we can answer yes to those two questions and answer to the last question, are my motives for this prayer, prayer God-centered or self-centered? If we can answer God-centered to the third question, then we should have no problem staying single-minded in our prayer. Now, we all understand, too, that we can't earn or we can't force a particular response from God because God responds to us according to his mercy and his righteousness, not ours. 
Let's look back at James chapter 1. Again, let's look at a second warning that James gives us here. It concerns the the double-minded hearing of the word. James 1, verse 22 through 25. Here we can see that the double-mindedness can creep into our attitude. And James admonishes his readers in verse 22. He says, Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. You see, it's true that we should, when we read this Bible, we should feel joy, right? We should feel happy about reading God, after we read God's word. But reading the Bible is just the means to an end, right? The goal is for us to become more Christ-like every day. To put it another way, a person should go, should go beyond just feeling good to actually striving to do good or to be good. A pleasant, satisfied feeling, brethren, can just deceive us into thinking that we've accomplished something when we really haven't. Look at Matthew 7, verse 24. Remember the story of the miraculous birth of Christ to Mary? And it's inspired many people, and rightly so, But when you consider this point, look at how few have been motivated by the story enough to actually follow Christ's example. All right? Matthew 7, 24 kind of gives us uh, an example of this. And he talks in here about the unwise people whose house is not built on a rock. He says this, Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is foolish. Could, has that ever described you? It has me. Could this ever describe us? On the other hand, those who want to obey Christ, it says, actually do what he says to do. We know what we're supposed to do. Right? Turn back to Hebrews chapter 2. Final thought on this point of concerning being double-minded hearers of God's word. Hebrews 2 reminds us, and we, we know that no one can earn salvation by anything that he or she does. But Hebrews 2 verses 1 and 4 tells us that we can lose it if we are hearers only. The title, the heading in my Bible says, Do Not Neglect Salvation. Hebrews 2, starting in verse 1, we'll read through verse 4. It says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward... How shall we, shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Verse 4, God also bearing witness, both with signs and wonder, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. I guess I want to ask, can, can it be more clear? Let me ask it again. Do you see your calling clearly? Brethren, do you see the immediate need now, today, to become laser-focused on God's kingdom and once and for all take your calling absolutely serious? If not today, when? The third area that I want to talk about that we need to guard against being double-minded is back in James chapter 2. James 2, we'll read verses 8 through 13. And this specific set of scriptures really targets the double-minded keeping of the law. James 2, let's read verses 8 through 13. It says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, 
quote, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Verse 9, but if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Verse 11, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. And now if you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. We know these things, right? Verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And if we look at most of the world religions today, we can see that the Christian world has been of two minds concerning God's law. Right? It's double-mindedness has led to the breaking of the royal law. It talks about in verse 8. Remember what it says, and you can write down Leviticus 19, verse 18. It tells us what the royal law, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. How does one break this law of love? Well, a common way is breaking even one point. James 2 at 10, it tells us of the royal law. He talks about then, goes from discussing the royal law of Leviticus 19.18 to going through the Ten Commandments as we see here. He says, he cites two of the commandments here in James 2. He says, do not commit adultery. Right? The seventh commandment. And the sixth commandment, he says, do not murder. And Jack, back in James 1.25, you can write that down. He calls the Ten Commandments, he says this, the perfect law of liberty. Yet mankind, again, has broken, has two, a double, double-minded, as the double-mindedness has broken led to the breaking of the royal law, right? This royal law, this perfect law of liberty shows us how to express love. We know we've been taught this, right? The ten points of the law are summarized in the commandment. The first four reflect, reflect love towards God. And those last six depict love of our fellow man, right? As is love of our, love our neighbor as ourselves, that, we've heard countless sermons on that, and there could be countless more just on that topic alone. How many of us have been guilty of breaking that? How many of us have been angry? I have on far too many occasions been angry or held grudges. How about any of us? When I do that, where in the Bible does it say that I can do that, especially against one of God's people? James 2, verse 10 through 11, he also shows the double-mindedness of embracing just one point, one of the Ten Commandments, while breaking another point of the law. We don't want to be those, one of those people. Actually, turn back to Matthew Christ prophesied here in Matthew of just these type of people. And I, we don't want to be one of these. Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Christ prophesied of people who think like that. Let it not be describing us. <clears throat> Matthew 7, starting in verse 21. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And verse 23, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. We don't want that to be describing any of us, brethren. So what about you? What sin do you hate the most? That's kind of a trick question, right? What sin do you think is the very worst, right? Stealing, lying, adultery, 
It's murder, right? You're ahead of me, way ahead of me. God wants you and I to hate every sin. Right? He wants us to abhor the breaking of any of the Ten Commandments as well as anything that is not pleasing in his sight. Brethren, we, this is an important point, and we have to be clear on this. Regardless of how much one believes in God, Regardless of how much someone believes in him, in Matthew 7, verse 21, Christ said this. He said, only he who does the will of my Father in heaven will enter his kingdom. We can plainly see here that, the, that these verses, that, that in these verses that God's will and his law are spoken of together because the law is an expression of his will. That's not what we see every day, is it? In our work, in, our tra- in the traffic everywhere we go. What we see in our world today is each person decides for himself what love is. Right? People in our world decide who we'll be generous with. We decide who we'll pray for and who we won't. We decide who we will forgive or who we won't. The list could go on and on. And the Bible's very clear on this, right? It plainly defines love. 1 John 5, verse 3 says this, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Brethren, even our our fellowship can mirror double-mindedness. James 2, verse 2, we read this earlier, but we can look at it. James 2. You know, James 2 talks about, uh, well, let's read it. James 2 says, For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, You sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, You stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Right? We could do that in our fellowship. Turn over to Galatians, if you would, just real quick. James was aware of the problem that be, can, can result from some of this uh, a hypocritical or, or, or you could describe it as two-faced fellowship because he was directly involved in the conflict between the apostles, uh, Paul and Peter. Remember that, Galatians 2, verse 11 through 16? Let's look at that real quick. <clears throat> Galatians 2, verse 11 it says, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. And we could go on and read this. But the verses show that Peter was subject to human weaknesses just like the rest of us. Right? It talks about in this instance, he would, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when, when they, talking about the Jewish believers sent from James, came, he refused to do it. Right? He withdrew and separated himself, fearing those, it says, who were of the circumcision. We can be susceptible to this, even if we don't realize it. Brother Peter, who's talked about here, grew into a great leader, Right? And, and a man of God he's described as. But in this instance, recorded for us here, he strayed from a lesson that Jesus had taught him years ago through a vision. You can write down Acts 10, verse 34 and 35 to revisit that. But it says this as we, in that vision. It says, In truth I perceived that God shows no partiality. See, Peter learned At the time of the revelation, he says, But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Peter knew this. 
right? We know this. But are we always good at it? Acts 10, verse 34, you can look up. Jesus, again, sets the ultimate example for us of not being a respecter of persons. Let's turn back to James 2. Let's look at a fourth warning against double-mindedness. Here in James 2, we'll read, start in verse 14. And as we start to read this, we're going to see that double-minded faith is, is not the wavering on one's belief in God. Rather, double-minded faith is, is believing in God without performing the actions, or with believing in God without showing the works that reflect our belief. Right? Going back to what we talked about, being a doer and not just a hearer. And here in James, make, he makes it clear that faith means so much more than just a belief in God. James 4, let's start reading in verse 14. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Verse 15, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Right? You did nothing. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Thus also by faith, if it does not have works, it is dead. And then verse 18, we see James challenges us to, to show something we can wrap our hands around, something tangible, right? Some, some concrete evidence of our proof. He says, show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, we go on to see here that, that belief is not enough. He says, even the demons believe and tremble. See, what it's saying here is it's so much easier to tremble at the thought of God's existence than it is to fear to disobey God. Do you fear disobeying God? Rather than a classic example, we won't go back there, but in Exodus 20, you remember what happened there in ancient Israel? You remember in Exodus 20, verses 18 to 19, the Israelites quaked with fear before God's awesome presence when God gave them the Ten Commandments. Go back and read that. But when they could no longer see him, right? You remember the story, Exodus 32, when they could no longer see the evidence of God's nearness to them, what did they do? They stopped trembling. Right? You remember they built themselves a golden calf while they should have been, again, trembling at the explicit instructions that God had revealed to them. Verse 20. We need to believe that what it says here, brethren. Faith without works is dead. We have to believe that. We have to understand that. Going on in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Verse 22, do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. But then I want to be called the friend of God someday. I bet that every one of you want to as well. Verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Verse 25, likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out on another way? And verse 26, for as the body is without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Simply coming to church every week, tuning into the Bible studies on Friday, every other Friday night, it's not good enough. 
God is very clear. That's not good enough. Let's look at James 3 then. The fifth and final point I want to discuss today here in James is in chapter 3. And before we read this, I'd I'd ask you a silly question. Have you ever been in a discussion or a group discussion with someone and you have a thought come to your mind and you think, I just probably shouldn't, I just probably shouldn't say what I'm thinking. But it came out anyway. You said it, and then afterwards you're like, I knew I shouldn't have said that. Of course you have, right? Of course you have. James 3, verse 9. Well, let's, let's start in verse 1. We're going to see in James 3, verse 9, he's, he talks about us speaking out of both sides of our mouth. But let's start in verse 1 of James 3. He says, My brethren, not, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Verse 2, and this is such a true statement, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, also able, able also to bridle the whole body. Verse 3, Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look at also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder whenever the pilot desires. Verse 5, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a fire a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. Verse 8. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Verse 9. With it we bless our God and Father and with it we curse men who have made have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeding bless, proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, he says, these things ought not be so. Does a spring send forth, send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. that not so true, right? James calls the tongue here an unruly evil full of of deadly poison. We understand, right, how how abusive a conversation can, can be. And we understand that an abusive conversation can undermine the powerful influences of prayer, right? can undermine the inspired reading of God's word, the impartial treatment of people. It can, it can undermine faith with works. It can derail all of those things. Brethren, before passing along information that could hurt someone, we should ask ourselves, does this really need to be said, or do I just want to say it? I'll feel better if I say it. (laughs) Or would more harm come by saying it or not saying it? If it does need to be said, am I talking to the right person? Just imagine, brethren, how the news and entertainment media or politics or our social lives could be so enhanced and so improved if we were to first think through the things Think things through the way James thought them through. All those apologies that we wouldn't have had to make, all those hurt feelings that we wouldn't have had or caused others to have if we just would have controlled what we said. It's very hard. The fact of the matter is, brethren, our conversation, right, our speech How we speak to others, who, what we share with others, speaks to our spiritual maturity or lack of it. 
You can write down Matthew 12, verse 34. I think this says a lot, right? Before, before examining the words that flow out of our mouths, we should examine the thoughts of our hearts and our minds. Jesus told this, this in Matthew 12, 34. He said this, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Right? Even, even though we can't always, okay, not always, many times, but we can't always control what we hear, right? We can't always control that. We can control what we hold dear in our hearts. And we, Mr. Perner talked about Satan, you know, and the prince of the power of the air, right? He relentlessly, every day, inspires a multitude of improper thoughts in us. And every day, he bombards us with corrupt communication, whether it be from our coworkers, from fellow students, from the, the people in line at the grocery store, whatever, acquaintances, movies, magazines, newspapers, right? They all transmit values and, and morals and behavior far removed from those that God expects of me and you. Nevertheless, though, we must assimilate God's words and ideals, right? They, they have to become a part of us. They have to, that, we want that to flow from our heart, right? We must keep all of God's words and ideals in our hearts and minds every day. Let's look at one last scripture as we start to wrap up here. James 4, verse 8. On this point, it just simply says this. James 4, verse 8, says it best. He tells us, Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Brethren, we know that we should pray boldly and without doubting. We know this. We know that we must read and digest God's word with great care. And we know that we can't take fellowship for granted. And we need to fellowship in true love and without bias. We know that we have to have faith while consistently keeping God's law. And that we must speak edifying words that inspire others. right? That inspire our friends and, and brethren to honor God. We're three weeks out now from having observed the last great day. If you look at the calendar, we have five long months to wait for the start of the spring holy days again, where we're once again going to be reminded of that great plan that God has for mankind. And remind ourselves of the fact that he's called us now to be a part of that plan, and he expects us to do something with it now. Over these next five months, brethren, how better could we spend that time than once and for all? No more excuses. Once and for all, putting our focus on taking our calling serious. Brethren, by, and this is important, by seeing that calling as precious and as seriously as God does. Let us all rem remember that with a single-minded attention to God's will, as he shows us in his word, that we can finally overcome those things in our life, and we can finally draw near to God, and he will draw near to us.